We're set. You want to take it away? Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Sustainability Leaders uh, Collaborative for our annual meeting here on April 7th. Um, excited for everyone uh, to uh, lean into some of the progress that we had to date, as well as looking forward uh, to where we can take it um, beyond today. Um, if you get a chance, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Go ahead and say hello, um, just so we can see who all is here in the room with us today while we share this slide deck. And go ahead and make sure to share uh, where you're from if, if it does, uh, doesn't happen on your uh, name. All righty. And so for the uh, opening uh, for today's agenda, we would love to uh, have a welcome uh, opening remarks from our leaders, the, the Dane County Executive, Joe Creasy, as well as Madison Mayor, Sachi Rhodes Conway. Uh, we'll go ahead and, like I said, talk a little bit about our celebration of success. Uh, and, and we would love for folks to, to uh, go ahead and uh, share as much as they can in the chats. And we would love to keep this very conversational uh, throughout this meeting. Um, and then we'll be looking at some of our opportunities coming down on the horizon. Uh, we also have a guest speaker here, uh, Joe Patter from the Public Service Commission Office of Energy Innovation, uh, who can talk a little bit more about the state level um, assistance with, with some of these opportunities. So uh, like I said, please go ahead and continue to introduce yourself in the chat. And with that, we'll go ahead and pass it over to Dane County Executive Joe Priestley. Thank you, Stacy and Kathy. Um, right before we got on, the mayor was thanking Kathy and Stacy for all the great work that they do, putting this together and keeping things going. And I just wanted to join you, Mayor, in offering my thanks to, to Kathy and Stacy and their teams and all the folks who've joined us who are doing such great work. You know, this is really exciting when we look back at when this was just a concept, this group, and then our first meeting and how quickly it has gained momentum and just the power of coming together and sharing knowledge and technology and enthusiasm and, you know, shifting our paradigm from why we can't do something to how we can do something and having, you know, this network of people we can turn to in order, to, in, in order to get things done. And we're seeing so much get done and it's really exciting and it's, and it's really empowering. Um, so again, thank you all for coming here today you know, to be part of this latest update and to see what's going on and see what else we can accomplish moving forward. You know, just quickly, I will say relative kind of to operations at, at Dane County, we continue to have a lot of really exciting things going on. You know, as gas went up to you know, $4-ish a barrel, we were continuing in Dane County to fill, um, you know, I believe a third of our highway trucks now, our snow plows and other vehicles with um, compressed natural gas made from methane we extract from our landfill and paying about a buck 50 a gallon for it, as I mentioned, the cleanest transportation fuel available. That's just one of the many, you know, examples of things we can do. Obviously not everyone on this call has a landfill, but a lot of folks do across the state. And part of what we wanna do is share with each other and share with our neighbors beyond um, Dane County and you know, other municipalities, other counties, other communities. Um, this year, Dane County is gonna um, you know, mark a landmark. We, we are going to break ground on our solar field, the Yahara Solar Project out by our landfill. And once that is up and running, Dane County will have achieved 100% renewable offset of all of the electricity used for county operations. And we're really proud of that. We're really excited about it, not only for ourselves, but again, to be able to demonstrate to folks, this is something that people can do. It can be accomplished. Boy, does it take a lot of work. It's easy for me to get up here and say this. I think of the years and years of work from our internal staff, from Kathy, from Dave Merritt, from all of our um, you know, facilities teams. Um, but they have it done, and we're doing what our community wanted, and we're doing our part, and every time we reach a milestone like this, excuse me, I just can't help but think about the fact that if the more people do this, the more we can make a difference, and, you know, our climate goals become a reality. It's just not something theoretical. Um, you know, so in addition to, you know, when, when we, what we try to do is every time we hit a goal, we look for another goal. So now that we're meeting in, in county government, our 100% renewable electricity offset, in my 2022 budget, I set a goal that all county facilities in our fleet will achieve carbon neutrality by 2025. 
Um, you know, we're going to do that by continuing to do a lot of what we're already doing, even though we've done a lot in renewables and energy um, efficiency. We're investing this year in another advanced comprehensive energy assessment to identify the next um, rounds of you know, projects we can do to reduce our use. Um, we're, we're looking at, as everyone here um, you know, is likely doing also, something that wasn't even on our radar screen a couple of years ago, and that's telecommuting. We're going to continue to have a large portion of county staff um, telecommuting at least several days a week, if not more. And you know, just the fact we look at the meeting we're in today, had everyone gotten in their car and driven downtown to the city county building to meet in person versus what we're the manner in which we're doing this meeting, um, just the carbon didn't get generated from that, um, you know, is a great potential for future savings. You know, and we're also looking at carbon sequestration. We had other another additional positions in the budget this year in our land and water resources department to look at our efforts to increase. Um, our purchases of land that we restore to prairie and to wetland, because as folks probably know, prairie can act as a carbon sink as effectively when you look at, 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 at volume and amount um, as forested land. And that will be an important part of our carbon neutrality also. And then finally, you know, before I sign off and turn it to the mayor, turn it to the mayor, you know, the mayor and I and the city and the county um, are looking at, you know, what comes next as far as landfill. And you know we're, our, our landfill is approaching capacity, and we are looking at developing um, you know a new landfill, but it will be next generation. It will be a diversion, recycling, um, um, energy generating, business incubating center. Just really 21st century, I guess. It's almost losing track of which centuries we're in now. But the next generation. Um, of, of, of what we do and how we dispose of and hopefully divert and reuse and recycle um, our waste stream. So lots of really great things happening. We're excited on the county level, but I have to say again, I'm just as excited about the partnership on the county level, our partnership with the city of Madison and with all of you. Um, you know, this work is contagious. Our progress is contagious and we definitely achieve more together um, when we work together. So thanks again to all of you for what you're doing. I get glimpses of all of the exciting projects out there and it gives me a lot of hope. So I'm looking forward to today and thanks a lot for being here. Thanks, Joe. Um, it's great to hear about the work that the county is doing and um, you have, and your staff have really been leaders um, on the in the realm of climate and I really appreciate it. Um, City of Madison is up to a lot of things uh, with respect to climate as well. I want to share a few of those successes, but um, let me start just by saying thank you to everybody for joining us today. And, um, I, you know, I do hope that we can get together in person sometimes, maybe in conjunction with other groups, uh, but it is it's certainly convenient to be uh, via the Zooms. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from all of you what you're working on and what you're excited about and uh, what you're looking towards next. Um, you know, it's uh, appropriate that we meet during Earth Month. Um, and yes, I'm just gonna claim the entire month, uh, right? We, we, can, we can give the Earth a month, I think, uh, at least. <laughs> um, and, you know, looking forward to, to uh, seeing, you know, how we can push forward together on a number of different fronts. There's some really exciting things going on. And I think we're going to um, share invitations to uh, upcoming events at some point. But um, let me talk a little bit about what the city has done over the past year. Um, in the built environment, um, I'm just immensely proud that Monona Terrace has managed to secure a lead platin, platinum existing building um, certification as that is a, a difficult thing to do. Um, and the staff over there have done a, a great job uh, with their operations to continue to, to achieve that level of sustainability. Um, we also uh, over, if you haven't yet been over to Ulbrich Gardens, um, we built a new um, center for, for learning. There's classrooms and um, all sorts of great stuff. And that also um, got a platinum certification and it's a beautiful building. It's well worth visiting if you haven't been over there yet. Um, 
In the also existing building front, um, we launched a program to address energy and water efficiency in naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, this is something that I hope everybody is looking at. We all have portions of our existing building stock that are aging and um, might not be as efficient as they could be. And so I'm really excited about this partnership that we have going at to improve energy and water efficiency in existing affordable housing, which will, of course, improve the building stock, but, but more importantly, improve quality of life for the people who live there and uh, reduce their utility bills as well. Um, we have doubled the size of our green power uh, trainee program. So these are the folks that are doing the solar installations on City of Madison property. They're also doing um, LED light switch outs um, and other sustainability related things. They um, have been involved in installing EV charging infrastructure um, around the city. Um, and it, so I'm just, I'm delighted that we're continuing to grow this program both because of the work that they're doing, but also because it means that we're growing our green jobs workforce. And these folks are, are prepared to go out and uh, become solar installers or um, they, we actually are trying to hire them all into our public works agencies uh, to keep them around. It's a great diverse group of people and uh, I just can't say enough about this program. I'm really excited about the results there. Um, of course, we have the Mata Sun program, which continues to uh, just be a total workhorse in our solar efforts. Um, we have touched 256 rooftops, um, which is, uh, 2,803, to be exact, kilowatts uh, of solar energy that's been installed. Um, and then speaking of, of solar installations, you may all have seen that the Hermsdorf solar field is now operational. And this is a program, uh, this is a solar field where um, mg and &E is, is running it. Um, and the most, if not all, Stacy, of the power is taken up by the school district and the city of Madison. Um, and so it's very exciting. It's uh, helping us get to 74% um, renewable uh, electricity for our operations here in the city. Soon to be 100, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but that, that uh, project has been um, really transformational for us. It's a very exciting project. On the transportation side, um, we just announced that we're going to go to 100% electric vehicles for our bus rapid transit system when that opens um, in 2024. I'm very excited about this, um, and it's uh, in large part thanks to the funding that will be available through the bipartisan infrastructure law, which I know we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but there's there are real opportunities uh, available through that bill, and um, we're very excited to take advantage of that. Um, we also have, if I haven't had a chance to brag about it in this group yet, we have the first ever in the United States of America electric municipal fire engine. It's out at Station 8. It's awesome. Um, very, very proud and excited about it. And hopefully um, they, uh, it's, it's a Pierce engine and they hopefully will be bringing these into production soon. Uh, we already have dibs on the first several off the line, but uh, you all can get in line after that. Um, it's, a, it's very exciting. Um, and then we are um, working on, for the vehicles that are, are, you know, we don't have EVs available yet. That's some of our, our heavier um, equipment. We're looking at uh, going to 100% biodiesel um, for, for some of our diesel engines. And that's also very exciting. Our fleet director, Mahanth, is very excited about this, would be happy to tell anyone much more <laughs> uh, on that. Um, and then the county exec uh, talked about the landfill. Um, we're very excited to be partnering um, on thinking about how we can take a more sustainable approach to waste. In general, um, we have uh, our award-winning Master Recycler program that's out there in partnership with Sustain Dane. I encourage you to, to share that opportunity with folks. Um, we've got two classes this year, one that starts today, Stacy, and uh, one that's in July, I think. So that's a great opportunity. Um, we are working on diverting our food waste, and Stacy's been working very hard on a program here um, to do everything we can to get food waste out of the landfill. 
um, and expand uh, composting options across the board. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, and in fact, we got a USDA grant to work on that. Um, so again, federal money uh, can help make these things happen. Um, and it, we have you know, been active on the national level as well. We joined the Better Climate Challenge through DOE um, and uh, Race to Zero. Um, we've gotten several grants um, to support this, um, as I know the county has as well. And I've been appointed to the EPA's Local Government Advisory Committee, where I'm chairing their air and climate work group. So I just offer if folks um, have feedback for the EPA around their programs or funding streams or um, work, uh, particularly related to air and climate, please let me know. Part of the job of the members of the Local Government Advisory Committee is to, to hear what's going on and to channel that feedback to the EPA. Um, so I think of me as a resource on that front. Um, and then I'm proud to say that I'm one of the co-chairs of Climate Mayors. Um, so if you're a mayor and you're not yet a member of Climate Mayors, I'd invite you to, to reach out to my staff and we can get you signed up. Um, there's, we're trying to grow our ranks there um, of mayors that are committed to working on issues around climate. Um, so I'm very excited. I mean, that's just a sort of backward looking um, I know we'll talk in a minute about sort of what's coming forward, um, but I, we're, we're continuing to push on all these fronts and I'm very excited about being able to work with all of you to make our communities more sustainable. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, um, Mayor, and thank you, County Exec. Um, so, so we're gonna shift now to some, um, my favorite thing, of course, celebrations of successes. We'll run through some um, visuals of, of some of the things that are really going well across our communities. And as we go through these, I again want to echo um, Stacy's encouragement earlier. If, if you have something to share that, that isn't reflected in my list, definitely put it in the chat. Because part of what I think is super cool about this work right now is it's really hard to keep track of everything you guys are doing. Like it's, it's, it was, way easier at the beginning than it is now. And that's excellent. I want to struggle to keep track of this. So my first big thing to share is that there are at least 100 solar installations on schools and local governments in Dane County. There are 100 on our map and the Hermsdorf project is not yet on the map. So there's at least 101 happening. Last year, we were at about 80. So that's a good pace in terms of growth. Kudos to everybody. Again, we maintain this map just to give people somewhere to go kind of look at what else is going on out there. So if it's, um, there's on our Dane Climate Action website, there's a main menu thing about maps and you can get to this map. And um, if you've got a project that isn't on it, you want to send me a photo so it gets on it. So that we're at a hundred is a pretty cool thing. It is also cool that we're now, now we've had two years of climate champions. So we've got more communities and school districts that have that climate, climate champion designation. Um, a number of new folks joined these ranks this year and I'm hoping that we grow that even more with the 2022 class of climate champions. So that that is growing. So this is recognition for stuff people are getting done. That's that's an exciting piece of, you know, Climate Champions is really about that, what people are getting done. I also have a map I maintain of the communities that have sustainability committees, because, and we'll talk about this in a couple of specific cases later, you know, these planning efforts are really important. And we've got new communities this year. Um, Stoughton is a new addition to this list, for example. Where, where communities have now set up sustainability committees and they're starting to work on a plan and they're talking about local values and what matters to them and all of that helps seed these efforts forward. So that's, that's like a really good kind of seed moment in this. Um, so, so earlier the county exec talked about how these things are contagious and, and actually that's kind of a theme of some of our um, slides today is really talking about um, some of the things that from, from where, where Stacy and I sit seem like they're contagious. You know, one of the cool things that happens with SLC 
is we try to create a forum where people can sort of share what's going on. And that can mean that one story inspires someone else to do something. So my favorite example of contagion, hands down, is net zero energy buildings. So, so likely many of you know that, that the Oregon School District built an elementary school, Forest Edge, that is, you may not know, the largest net zero energy school in North America at this point. Um, and in their first year of operation, they produced 24,000 more KWH than they consumed on site. So that's you know, a solar um, powered school with a geothermal heat pump system, no natural gas go into that facility, um, really outperforming estimates. You might not know that the village of McFarland currently has under construction a public safety building that will be our second net zero energy public facility. And Earlier, earlier this um, year, I had a chance to talk to the village board chair in McFarland about this project. And um, Carolyn Klaus shared that, that, you know, as they were thinking about this, and they're building this, remember, when we've got rising construction costs, there are all kinds of challenges right now with the, the pushback against doing net zero. But, but part of what she said to me was, you know, they were really thinking as a board about how do they explain their decisions 10 or 15 years down the road? And, and that it made so much sense to be thinking about this project in a way that, that 15 years from now, they could say, well, of course we did this. This is what, this is what leadership looks like. And Andrew um, Bramer, who's a planner in McFarland, I wanna invite you to just jump in here and maybe add something. You should be able to unmute yourself. I should have fixed it so you can do that. Thank you, Kathy. Kathy, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, we're super proud of this project, obviously. Um, there's a lot of net zero buildings out there. We're uh, under the understanding this is the first one that's a net zero police fire station. Uh, in the state. So we're proud uh, to be leading in that direction as well. And yeah, I mean, we thought going through this project that we had enough cushion built in uh, with our estimating, uh, even in this market, uh, that our estimates were pretty good. And then they bids came back and they're $2 million higher than you expect. And uh, I think everybody on the call has been there before. And, you know, the the board could have taken a direction to just cut the geothermal and cut the solar out. But uh, no, uh, that, that didn't meet our sustainability plans and our goals. Uh, and they recognize the importance of, of keeping that in. Um, and I just want to share one other note. Um, uh, the mayor brought this up with the solar group buys. Um, we've started to publicize the availability of those uh, three times a year in newsletters that hit every household in McFarland. And from 2011 to 2020, uh, we did um, 18 residential solar rooftop projects, building permits. Last year, when we started announcing it, we did 31 in one year. Um, so the power of just letting people know in your community about these programs, we've seen a tremendous spike. Um, so um, just wanted to share that. And, and thanks for the time. Kathy. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. That's a, that's a great yeah, yeah, and we'll talk more about Madison at some point, but but to just reinforce this point right now, um, again this year, Dane County is is providing sponsorship support to Madison, so residents across the county can participate in the program. So that that is one of these really valuable partnerships we have with the city that we can make that program available. So it's terrific that you're promoting that, Andrew. Okay, so our first contagious trend was this net zero energy buildings. The second trend, this is one that, that the exec and the mayor talked a little bit about, is, is we're seeing this really cool trend now toward our local governments getting 100% clean electricity for their local operations. And so in, in Dane County, the, the first across the finish line is, is the village of Shorewood Hills. Which, which is buying green power from MG&E. And you know, part of this is everybody is doing this in a slightly different way because everybody has slightly different needs and assets that can be part of this. 
again, as the exec said, um, Dane County, um, he set a goal that that um, Dane County have 100% of its electricity be renewable by 2025. My amazing colleagues are going to make that happen by 2023 when Yahara Solar goes online. Um, Madison, the mayor mentioned this, is at 74% renewable electricity right now, given, given that Hermsdorf project going live. And Sun Prairie, just a week and a half ago, their council approved that, that they, would, they would pursue 100% renewable electricity by 2025. So we've got more and more communities sort of adding on to this with really near-term aggressive goals. Um, and there might well be others. Definitely you should um, ping that in the chat if you've got one that we didn't cover there. Um, but so, so that's an exciting thing to see what's happening there. And then definitely clean fuel vehicles is a way that we're seeing a lot of contagion. You know, we've done a couple of events with SLC members to showcase the, the both electric, RNG, and biodiesel, I guess that's three it's, um, options, you know, giving, giving folks opportunities to um, kick those tires. That's a picture there of Madison's um, electric fire truck. Those are all um, Madison fleet vehicles in that photo. Um, and this is a place where, where I'm excited to see, you know, at our last fleet meeting, um, some of the smaller communities who were there were pursuing electrification of some of their park equipment and things. And, you know, I think everybody's got an angle on this where they're starting to move forward and our ability to learn from each other as we start adopting those technologies is, is really exciting. So, so yes, on, on the um, fleet electrification and clean fuelness. Um, kind of on the other end of the climate challenge is all of the work that so many of you are doing around climate resilience. You know, the, the county's emergency management team has been leading that process to update the, the joint county community um, natural hazard, natural disaster hazard mitigation plan. Um, and we've got more communities participating than before, a bigger portion of the population participating. And this year in the planning, there was really an emphasis on climate resilience. You know, everyone still remembers the 2018 floods. And, and so we saw communities across the county really thinking hard about how do we prepare for these, these big rain events that we know are gonna be more and more likely in our future. So, so it's exciting to see those efforts too and the collaboration on that end of things. And then I said I'd come back to planning. Um, there, there, there has been a lot of planning going on across the county. We've got places like Madison updating their sustainability plan. We've got Stoughton creating their first sustainability plan. We wanted though to highlight for a moment Middleton. So Middleton um, received a grant to become, uh, to do the lead for cities process. And it's, it's helped them really pull sustainability together across all of their plans. Their comprehensive plan now includes information about sustainability in ways that I think um, lots of us think is really cool. And I think, Mike Davis, you can unmute yourself and say a little bit about this effort. Thanks, Kathy. Can you hear me all right? Yes. I appreciate the, uh, the shout out for our comprehensive plan. It was a long time in the making, but we have embedded sustainability concepts throughout the plan. And it, uh, uh, it's, it's hard to really separate sustainability from uh, development because the, the goal that we have as a community is to grow sustainably in all that we do, to preserve green space and to uh, meet our goals for a renewable energy supply over the years so that we by 2035 are uh, and maybe earlier are covering all of our city operations needs through re renewable energy resources. 
So one of the ways in which we have done this be, is that we have updated our tax increment district plans as well over the years prior to the comprehensive plan. And we have two TIDs in place and both of those have uh, sections devoted to our incentives for private development for sustainable um, and renewable energy development. So we, through our TID process, we incentivize solar and geothermal and uh, even purple pipe, uh, which is recycling of, of rainwater for those who might not know that. So we are working to embed the values of the community through private development and our TIF incentives. And we think long-term that will help us reach that overall community goal so that we reach that 100% renewable. I believe our goal is 2045 for that as a community or 2050. So <clears throat> that um, uh, one thing about the TID plans is that we plan comprehensively in knitting together various uh, redevelopment areas of the community um, with the use of public lands to connect because you have to have contiguity to do so. And that comprehensive planning of our TIDs enables us then to uh, weave that in for development opportunities around the community. And we do have a lot of infill development, which in itself is sustainable from a, a tax um, and cost and benefit um, as well in preserving outlying uh, rural areas from future development. So um, thank you for this opportunity and, and shout out, really appreciate it. Definitely, definitely. We're, um, Kelly Hilliard from Middleton was on our um, Accelerate um, Solar webinar a couple of weeks ago, and we, we've been sending out that um, video. If you um, need a link to that, you can ping me and I'll um, find the link again. But um, she talked about the TIF stuff, and I know there was a lot of interest there from other communities to think about how to leverage their, their um, TIF districts to encourage more activity. So yeah, so we've got, you know, the, the whole more communities doing more creative things to really push this forward. Um, and then our last contagion is about ripple effects. Stacey, I'm going to let you take this one. Yeah, so um, I, I just, um, I think that there's the sustainability journey that communities uh, start walking the path on, right? You start out as being sort of sustainability curious. Uh, you start listening to hear about what other communities are doing. And sometimes it's, it's figuring out how to take those first steps. And a lot of times it starts sometimes with community. Maybe there's residents who are asking about sustainability and, and uh, coming to council meetings or reaching out to their elected leaders. Um, or there's just some energy with a group of, of um, uh, residents that would like to form a group maybe and, and, and start meeting. And before you know it, those start to become more um, organized or more codified. And um, I think City of Sun Prairie is a great example of how that sustainability curiosity has now gotten them to this point with um, the recent hire of Scott Semrick. Um, so I would like to pass it over to Scott to talk a little bit about how that journey came along for City of Sun Prairie and, and what they've been recently doing after, after said hire. Thank you, Stacy, and hello to the SLC. It's wonderful to have the opportunity to share out and have a unique perspective kind of coming in halfway through this process. Um, so very briefly in 2020, the Sustainability Task Force was formed and that was a really a partnership between our alders, the community and stakeholders. And I think over about 18 months, they convened working groups and dedicated time and resources to culminate with this uh, very comprehensive report here that gave me quite a playbook to work from with about 130 different recommendations, one of which was to create and hire for my position, which I was fortunate enough to be in this role. And we've been hard at work. And I have to say just an immense thank you to the SLC group in general 
having those resources available, uh, the peers, the research, the knowledge base that's available just has helped accelerate our efforts by years, if not more, um, just bouncing ideas off and learning from others. So that task force disbanded, but then a permanent committee was created by our council. Uh, we've been working with a lot of different partners. So working with those SLC, our peer coordinators, uh, doing a fleet assessment, looking at those alternative fuel vehicles, uh, working with uh, different membership programs and learning again from our peers, uh, looking at that resiliency uh, component, this microgrid project that we were able to receive a grant for has really allowed us the opportunity to look at our, our community resiliency and our operations. And then as Kathy mentioned, very excited to report that we have uh, done a lot of research with our utility partner and we were able to set a total electricity boundary for our entire city operations. We're actually at 49% of the way there currently. And by 2025, our goal is to be 100% clean renewable generation to expand on our existing goal. Uh, and then I also saw in the chat uh, mention of No Mo May. I'm also excited to share. We uh, enacted this for the first time ever in Sun Prairie. So we're allowing both residents and community partner organizations to participate. And it's one of our many efforts in the community. And we're really proud to be working on this stuff collaboratively. So again, thanks for the opportunity to share. Bet. Yeah. And um, I think if you if you are a community that is considering, you know, taking some of those steps around sustainability, please reach out to, you know, us, City of Sun Prairie, talk a little bit about what it could look like for, for your community, because we're, we're here to help. And um, there's a I think I even saw in the chat talking about plans, just the, the old copy and paste, right? Like we're we're here to show some of the models out there that can be transferable to, to all communities. All right, next slide. So we wanted to also just kind of give a, a recap of, of the last year of activity. Um, these are, you know, we had these annual meetings, but in between, we're also doing lots of fun stuff. And and I'm just a shout out to all of the staff that have been attending um, the workshops and the webinars uh, to, to uh, learn from, from each of our communities uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer model. Um, the last time we met together for the annual meeting was February of last year. Um, and then we followed it up immediately with a stimulus planning webinar. Again, thinking about some of the news that we were hearing around stimulus and we wanted to start kind of planting seeds and getting ideas and brainstorming uh, happening. Um, we had a meeting in August to talk a little bit about land use and transportation plans, um, thinking of uh, the whole uh, community, the, uh, whether the Capital Area Region Plan Planning Council or the MPOs and how all of that is, plays into how our communities will be growing over the next several decades. We had another fleet gathering uh, in October. That's the old uh, bring, bring everyone together to kick the tires, look under the hood. Um, we were at the new uh, fleet facility uh, for City of Madison at, at, at Nakusa Trail. So not only did we get to showcase the vehicles uh, and talk a little bit about some of the newer vehicle technologies, but we also talked about some of the building um, elements that make it a, 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 a gold lead building uh, with some really, really fun features. And so um, that I, I, that's a really popular topic for everyone. So we're hoping we can continue to do that on, on an annual basis, especially as a lot of these vehicle technologies that are coming into play for some of the heavy duty vehicles or some of these other um, uses that, that will be either electrified or other alternative fuels such as biodiesel and uh, renewable natural gas. And then we uh, late last year, we circled back around on federal funds and local action. Uh, we had a couple smaller groups meeting just to kind of talk a little bit through some ideas that were gathered in March around topics of interest uh, for potential federal funding projects. And then as Kathy mentioned, um, just a few weeks ago, we had an Accelerate Solar webinar talking a little bit about how how to go solar. There, as, as Kathy mentioned, uh, you know, we are all approaching it from different ways. There's different products out there. There's different utility models out there. And so trying to share out some of those various types of going solar so that um, we can, you know, again, share best practices, lessons learned uh, to, to help achieving some of our, our renewable energy goals. All right. 
And then, so before we get started on uh, some of the next topic, which is kind of looking forward and getting prepared to federal funding, I just want to offer if anyone else has uh, any sort of trends or topics uh, that they're seeing out there, you know, what is what is contagious for you? What, what are you seeing out there? What are you seeing in the news for communities? We'd like to capture that in the chat so that we can um, use the, that information for uh, planning purposes going into the 2022 year of SLC. And so with that, I, I'm going to pivot a little bit. So we look back at all the accomplishments. We talked a little bit about what activities the SLC has been up to with our workshops and webinars. And we really wanted to take a moment here, especially um, you know, with, although we have had some webinars and workshops around federal funding, we thought this might be a different audience. So we wanted to really kind of sit, sit uh, uh, together around discussing federal funding um, as it's becoming more real. And so just a, a just to do some uh, ground checking on some of the uh, acronyms. So IIJA is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, we also are seeing BIM out there for the bipartisan infrastructure, or sorry, BIL for the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and so the word infrastructure is all over these, um, these things coming out of, of the federal government. And what I think is somewhat of a misnomer is that infrastructure, you might think of just bridges, just roads. And although they are a component of the um, uh, federal funding, there's a lot of other components as well. Um, some areas that we're really excited to see as part of the IIJA is the energy and grid opportunities. So as we were talking about some of our renewable energy goals, we're gonna also need to you know, look at our grid and look at our energy sources. And so this is a, an opportunity to think about what investments we could have here in our communities to help us get to those renewable energy goals. We we're also very excited about resilience. Um, Kathy mentioned, you know, this natural hazard mitigation planning process um, that the county has led on. And that planning process will be essential for helping us um, set us up, up for success to receive federal funding um, with these resilience dollars. Um, so again, keeping our eye on, on that as it's coming forward will be, will be key. Um, I will note that um, this slide is actually from the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. Um, and this is an entire slide deck. We uh, will be sharing that with you um, in our Sustainability Leaders Collaborative folder. We also will have a ton of other resources in that folder to help us kind of break down the over 400 page law into what we want to focus on here uh, in Dane County for our communities. Um, so I highly recommend checking out the entire slide deck um, from the USDN. Next slide. And so some of the other resources that we've been kind of winnowing down to, to bring to this group is uh, a couple of trackers that we run across that, are, that have been super helpful. Um, so we have three top three trackers here that look at various funding opportunities, as well as looking at the federal funding for local decarbonization. These trackers will be updated on a regular basis. These are available to everyone. Um, so this is the first kind of stop a little bit. Once we're, we're coming up with those ideas is to find out where we can then locate the funding source or funding stream to, to help with some of these project ideas. I'll also point out that the fourth bullet point has an equity design consideration. Um, the federal government has uh, what's called Justice 40 um, that is looking to have 40% of these federal funds going to uh, disadvantaged uh, communities. And so this is something to be taking into consideration as we're crafting project proposals and partnerships. Next slide. And so they, uh, there have been some listening sessions um, that I've been able to sit in on and uh, just to kind of give a little bit of a background. We Information is coming out from the federal government, but it's kind of coming out in some pieces. And so one of, one of the elements that I think is, is helpful to note is there's a timeline. And that timeline varies uh, based on each agency, uh, funding stream and program. Uh, this is a screenshot from the listening session from the EPA. Uh, the EPA, uh, as you can see from the left-hand column, they are splitting it into six different um, program areas. And again, the funding streams coming out of those program areas are going to differ. 
Um, I, I'm point to point to the third row, the solid waste infra infrastructure programming. Uh, they are having uh, stakeholder engagement uh, sessions from mid March to mid June. And so this is an opportunity for, for communities to give feedback on what would be most helpful uh, to provide funding for and how to provide that funding for communities. Uh, Mayor Rhodes Conway also offered to pass along information to the EPA. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. Um, it's, and I would say for all of the federal agencies, you know, consider them an open door, open phone call for us to do some ground checks and some of our proposal ideas uh, and to check in on some of the funding streams. Um, I'd also recommend signing up for e-newsletters. So if there's a funding program that you wanna keep track of, signing up for that e-newsletter is gonna be key to getting that uh, immediate email as soon as an RFP is posted for a funding opportunity. And just kind of circle back to that third row, um, the uh, EPA is coming out with a new um, funding stream called SWIFR. It's an acronym of some, some way, shape or form that I'm not gonna remember right now, but, but basically there is going to be money for recycling education grants. So those will be issued, it looks like mid-September. Um, so signing up to receive notification as soon as that's available. And so planting the seed now for everyone on the call here about ways in which we could maybe leverage some um, recycling education dollars. And what does that look like for our communities here in Dane County? Next slide. And so signing up for, I mentioned signing up for e-newsletters from federal agencies. I would also highlight that we have our state partners that are also funneling information to communities here in Wisconsin. So this is an email that I received from the Wisconsin DNR um, notifying about the release of the Clean School Bus Program funding from the EPA. And what's great about this email is this is a direct copy and paste. So I apologize, it's a little text heavy, but this is just to showcase how they took what more than likely is a 40 page RFP uh, down to a single email and, and breaking it down into what it is, how to apply, how to sign up for those email notifications from the EPA, what, what sort of information they're looking for. And you can see in these bullet points, they're looking for the number of buses, ages of the buses, um, routes for the buses. And so that can help you think about the, the information gathering that you'll need to do uh, in the interim between when the RFP is issued and the proposals are due. They have some other considerations, just making sure, again, you're, you're prepared to submit, as well as some uh, resources for more information. So again, thinking about some of the state agencies for which these federal funds will be flowing through, uh, or, or if they uh, will be notifying through with information um, in those e-newsletters. So again, reach out to Kathy and myself if you have any questions about where to sign up, how to sign up, uh, and we can we can share that with you. And also we're looking on ways in which we can then push out this information to the greater SLC so that um, if you miss an email, we, we can let everyone on the SLC know. Next slide. So this is again, another slide from that, that really great USDN slide deck. Again, they had that high level buckets of funding. They actually break down each of those buckets of dollars uh, into some of their programmatic elements. Um, so again, recommend checking out the slide deck. The, the link is at the bottom of this slide as well as uh, will be sent out in the follow-up. Uh, but the, the big steps that to take, <laughs> to think about taking as a community um, is making sure you're prepared to submit if you are gonna be submitting a proposal. Um, and the grants.gov is the, generally the website for submitting grant proposals. And there's just a, a couple of steps that you need to take to make sure that you're registered in, in, and not waiting until the day, the due date to, to make that happen. But the next step really is, is for us to start thinking about project ideas. And so going back to your teams, uh, going back to your community and thinking a little bit about what are the existing priority or areas or projects uh, for sustainability, um, and as well as not only project ideas, but partnerships. And I would just, you know, highlight the fact that some of the grants that the city of Madison has been awarded has been in partnership with organizations who help kind of with the, the heavy lift of grant applications, but also it's a, a boon for building those relationships in those communities. And again, just kind of echoing again that Justice 40 uh, component 
A lot of these RFPs that are coming out will have a uh, guidance in the grant RFP of uh, how many partners are maybe required on a grant proposal. So um, just keeping that in mind that those building those relationships and having those conversations now will be helpful for when that RFP is released and you're, you're ready to hit the ground running. Um, they talk about testing concepts. And so that's, again, you know, once we have a top three ideas, uh, how can we bring it back together and see if there's some areas that we can collaborate on some of these project ideas, um, go in together potentially uh, on a funding opportunity. Uh, we have done this before. Uh, there is a Seven communities went in together on a, a planning grant from the State Energy Office, Office of Energy Innovation. And so that's just one model that we're kind of uh, thinking about for how we can bring everyone together, especially for these competitive grants, and thinking a lot about how we want to make sure that these are investment dollars that are coming to, to communities here in Dane County. And then the, the last is obviously getting ready to submit. And just to, to give a, a, a idea, sometimes you have about four to six weeks from when the RFP is issued to then when the due date is for these, these grant applications. So that's a can be a pretty tight timeline if this pre-work has not been already done. So that's why we wanna to start today um, with this idea generation and planning um, and partnership work. And with that, I think I'm done talking about sort of the high level of the federal funding uh, coming through. Um, Please invite any questions that you might have to include in the chat or follow up with with Kathy and I, and then also to, to check out some of the resources in our in our Google folder. Stacy, I think we were going to do the poll now. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So so part of what we want to understand there's a should be a poll that pops up is how we best sort of help you stay informed about this, which communication venues. Kind of work best for you on this. So if people want to fill out that poll. Can you see the poll? Yes. I'm not seeing any results yet. So can others see the poll? I, okay, see I saw it. it, but then it disappeared. Hey, Kathy, you know, I think I may have accidentally done that because I don't fill it out and I might be on an administrator thing and I pressed end poll. <laughs> so, there I is. see. Okay, wait. See, that's it's what happens back. when you get me anywhere near the controls. Sorry about that. That's okay. It's back now. Everyone, no one touched that red end poll button for a little bit here. It's lit. It looks like we've got most folks voting there, so I will end it and now now I can share results. Um, and so it looks like it looks like kind of the things we've been doing that yeah, you want us to talk about it in the monthly SLC newsletter we've been doing, but also maybe some direct emails where we see those opportunities and and looking for chances to do webinars. So yes, all of the above. Okay. Thanks, guys. That okay. And, and then I think we're set to segue. So so we're really happy that that Joe Pater from the Office of Energy Innovation could join us today. You know, they're the state energy office, so they're sort of the conduit for a lot of the the federal funding. And and Joe, we thought you could just talk a little bit about kind of what's going on from your vantage point. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. And thank you for the invite. Thank you for the, the chance to be here and speak with everybody. I think it's a really exciting time in Wisconsin. Uh, and certainly Dane County is poised to help lead the entire energy transition across the state. Um, and, I, and I hope that, you know, in my next few minutes here, I can help uh, anybody on the call kind of get a sense of what the Public Service Commission is doing around the lens of, um, you know, the roadmap to zero carbon, uh, whether it be in our focus on energy program or the state energy office and opportunities that are going to be coming from the federal government. So I'll, I'll kind of take this a few steps uh, at a time here. I just want to start by saying focus has opened 
the quadrennial uh, planning process for the next quad. I'm going to put a, a link into the chat here, which will take you to all the documentation related to it. Today, the commission took up the first phase of that process. And uh, I wanted to just give you a little bit of insight into uh, maybe a decision that had just been made. Um, so on the topic of decarbonization and whether or not focus should play a role in an effort to decarbonize uh, Wisconsin, the commission has chosen alternative two, which specifically says the focus program should play a larger role in cost effectively reducing carbon emissions and the next quad should serve as a tr transitional period during which the program continues to emphasize energy savings, but also seeks to make measurable progress toward that transition uh, with greater emphasis on reducing carbon. Um, and they also selected sub-alternative C, which asks the Evaluation Working Group, or uh, EWG, to develop recommendations to operationalize and um, create enhanced measurement uh, capabilities for the program. Um, so I guess long story on that one, or short story on that one, is they have chosen not to make carbon reduction the focus of the next quad, but they are acknowledging the importance of it, and they're acknowledging the need for focus on energy to really be able to track the impacts it has on reduced emissions across the state. So we see that as uh, kind of exciting. Uh, the second, or I guess that's my focus on energy update. I just want to kind of uh, say that we oversee focus from the lens of the, the state energy efficiency uh, renewable board that really runs focus. We're kind of their support alongside uh, the administrator, the evaluator, the compliance agent, et cetera. So if, I guess if you ever have anything related to focus that either you're struggling with or you're just confused by, um, and maybe you're not getting the answer you need directly from focus, feel free to come to our office because we can, uh, you know, whether it's we're applying pressure to get something done or whether it's you're raising an issue to us that the administrator is not making clear to us, uh, your perspective is extremely valuable, especially as you look, you know, outside of what focus is doing today and what it should be doing in the future. So feel free to come to our office at any time and uh, we will be able to engage with the focus team to support you. And now I'll pivot over to talking about the state energy office. Um, you're probably well aware of the Ener energy innovation grant program that we've had in market for a few years now. Uh, in the most recent round, which I'll uh, put a link to our, uh, our story map here in the chat, um, there were uh, projects, eight projects in Dane County that were funded in the most recent round. Um, and one of the projects that you're benefiting from maybe, but not necessarily in Dane County, is that Pierce Manufacturing Project uh, that was approved up north where we're putting solar and storage onto their manufacturing facilities. You know, of course it's not in Dane County, but here you are a uh, beneficiary of, uh, you know, the first electric fire truck, which is kind of cool and a great Wisconsin story. Um, and so in addition, we have 105 more applications that are up for commission review next Thursday, where they're going to be making a decision on those projects. There's 21 of them that are in from Dane County, uh, and it's a $10 million round this time around. So it is much bigger, and um, we expect a lot of great things to come of it. So uh, you will find real soon here some more projects happening in Dane County through that program. And then also we do expect a new round of funding to be open sometime later this fall. Uh, the commission will probably take up the scoping on that in September. Um, there are, there's $13 million remaining in the fund that we have been drawing from uh, for EIGP and the commission may decide to use it all for this next round or they may cut it up a little bit. Um, but that's, that's kind of the story on the next round of the IGP. And uh, I know microgrids were uh, mentioned a number of times here, um, especially in regard to Sun Prairie. They recently were awarded uh, a feasibility study uh, in, that, um, in Sun Prairie. And then I just put another link to our map that shows all the projects. And there are five of them total in Dane County, uh, including Middleton, um, Holy Wisdom Monastery, just a lot of great projects that are happening. And I will say, in regard to the technology involved in developing microgrids, 
you know, I think this is where Wisconsin's really going to be able to shine. Um, you know, we are a rural state. We've got a lot of rural communities that are going to need uh, the ability to either island themselves or to um, really benefit from the renewable energy transition by having paired generation and storage. So uh, you're going to see more and more investment out of our office here at the PSC. Uh, there's a lot of things happening, I think, at the utility level where they're starting to see the benefits uh, for resiliency and energy security purposes. Um, and, you know, our, our delegated commissioner is uh, Commissioner Tyler Hebner, who um, you probably all know has a very uh, strong interest in developing the renewable energy sector in Wisconsin. Uh, and he talks a lot about microgrids. Uh, so, I think what's likely to happen here is you're just going to see a continued advance in uh, the knowledge of these technologies. And our office is going to continue to put money out there for you to apply for to make projects happen. And that's what it's really all about, making stuff happen. Um, and then speaking specifically to the bipartisan infrastructure law, there are three programs that we will be responsible for helping to distribute across the state. Uh, the EECBG funding, the, the funds that don't go to cities and municipalities directly, those funds for smaller communities will come through our office. It's approximately $2.4 million, and we will distribute it uh, in the or following the guidance that DOE has provided. Not quite exactly sure the way it will actually be distributed. Um, we're talking about either grant programs or direct allocations. There's still some room for us to kind of understand what DOE is requiring. That's 2.4 million to smaller communities. There's also $2 million in funding that's gonna to come to the state for a revolving loan fund. And um, we are currently in the process of kind of engaging with um, uh, the public sector and determining, can we match these funds with, with public or uh, private capital? Um, what kind of opportunities can be there for the state in, in that money? And actually 25% of that can just be grants. So we might just simply do that for part of that, part of that 2 million. And then there will be 10.3 million that'll come directly to our office um, for uh, basically uh, a continuation of the grant programs that we're putting out there. And I think it's through avenues and you know, kind of opportunities like this where we're gonna get ideas for, hey, what, what do communities across the state really need? And what kind of um, advancements in our grant offerings do we need to make to get more communities involved? You know, I think the risk here for Wisconsin, you know, I know, I know Dane County is kind of like um, progressively leading the charge and has a lot of great intelligence on this, on this work, but there's a lot of other places across the state that don't have this type of leadership. And um, one of the risks we have is that we don't invest in, in those areas and we kind of leave um, those communities behind. So that's something we're trying to keep a really close eye on. And then there's a ton of competitive grant programs. I won't go through much of them, but I'll just say that the ones we know 100% we'd be willing to partner with you on um, are things like the Ener Energy Auditor Training Grant Program, uh, grants for renewables in schools, energy storage demonstration pilots, and the energy improvement in rural and remote areas, uh, which includes microgrids. Uh, so these are programs that we're going to be seeking collaborative partnerships with cities, uh, counties, tribes, really whoever wants to come to the table and partner on an application and try to go after some of this competitive money. Uh, there's a lot of excitement over here about really putting our, our best foot forward to get as much as we can for Wisconsin. Um, so feel free to reach out if you want to engage on any of these or any of the others, really. If there's anything else that you have on your mind that you want state support on, uh, bring that to us and we'll get it in front of the right people. Um, and then I'll just mention too, we're involved in the DOE Cold Climate Heat Pump Challenge. Um, and this is uh, pairing manufacturers with utilities and state agencies. Um, we're really, we, we need heat pump technology to really be able to, uh, uh, appropriately take the next step in the energy sector in Wisconsin. I, I think we'd all agree though that heat pumps are kind of an enigma to a lot of consumers. Like, do I need one? Can I have one? And then you've got contractors maybe, you know, mixing it up with, hey, you don't want one because they're not reliable. 
a, a lot of, we're at like the early stages, I guess is what I will say. And um, here in Madison, of course, we see heat pumps, people are putting them up. Um, but the expansion of that across the state, I think is really important. And we're investing in that as well. So um, I think that's all I have. I'd be happy to take any questions and I hope this was helpful. Um, but yeah, that's our, that's our office, OEI. Terrific. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, and yeah, certainly if folks have questions, um, plunge them in the chat. You know, we will have some time here for that. Um, I think the last thing we wanted to do a little bit of looking forward. Um, so thinking about um, SLC events likely in the next few months. So one of the things that, that is an on, um, that we're thinking about offering a webinar on is, is some tree canopy work. So, so this, is, this is work that builds on, it turns out that um, CARPSI has done some really good mapping work around the tree canopy in Dane County using various data sets. It goes back to 2010 and 2017. And we can see through these maps they're building how, how we're losing tree canopy in the county. And um, folks on uh, Mel Aske in our office has been working with um, folks at the city and CARPSI and now at the university and we're we're combining that tree data with other data about where, um, where there are disadvantaged communities and kind of that census block vulnerable communities data. We know trees make folks less vulnerable to a lot of climate risks. And I think, I think by early summer, we're gonna have a, a workshop on kind of what we're learning there and how communities might be able to use some of that data in their own planning and priorities. So that's, that's one piece that we're um, looking forward to. But we always like to take um, an opportunity to also um, ask you when we have you together, what other topics you might be interested in. So I'm going to launch a poll. None of my co-hosts should close that. Let's, let's, give our participants, a, and again, it's, you know, select whichever ones are of interest to you. And I don't know that I said this before, there's an other, you can hit other and then just in the chat, list other things that you would like to see us um, having um, more attention to. Give people a minute to do that. There's a lot of choices there, so it takes people a little bit to submit, I'm realizing. Um, it looks like we're, I'm not seeing more. Oops, I would have cut that person off. Okay, 30 seconds and I'm gonna close the poll. I can't tell who's in the middle of voting. And so I have this fear that I'm gonna cut you off before you're done voting and then then who knows what will happen. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll and I'm gonna share the results. Um, oh, lots of things. Um, the, um, the green infrastructure is something, Stacy. we haven't done a workshop on in a while. That, I mean, it ties to the tree canopy, but there's, obviously much bigger things there too. This might be good time to circle back to some of those. And it's interesting, you've got some community-wide topics floating up in addition to some um, site-specific. So this is terrific. I think it gives us some really good ideas about things that, that and it looks like there's stuff in the chat too. So that is cool. Um, I'll stop sharing that. And I think then, um, then the before we kind of open it up for questions or discussion, we had a couple of upcoming events and opportunities to highlight. Um, 
On April 28th is Wisconsin Clean Cities Transportation and Innovation Expo. So some of you might remember this from pre-COVID times. It's been a while, but pre-COVID, they had this event at the Alliance Energy Center. And um, there is a program of workshops that day that you can access at that link. But there also is, they have an amazing exhibit arena for this event where, where um, is the first place I ever saw an electric bus um, before Madison had one they were showing off. And, and you know, it's, it's a nice chance to talk to some of the vendors from some of those clean fuel vehicles. So definitely we hope that's on your radar. And then to the um, Madison program, we mentioned this a little bit earlier. So the Solar Group Pi program for Madison is available to um, residents across Dane County. Um, and yeah, we encourage you to follow the lead of McFarland and promote that program to your, your constituents. So, so you can tell us that you're you have a bunch more solar on roofs in your community than you had the year before. And Andrew's example there was terrific. And I just wanted to highlight that I threw in the chat that um, Madison is going to have a webinar on April 21st to talk about the group buy. So if you have uh, folks that are interested to learn more, that's a great opportunity to sit in and learn what the process is to do a group buy. Um, and it's it's virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of wherever you're at. And um, so I highly recommend yeah, promoting that upcoming webinar uh, since we are kicking off uh, what should be a, an exciting year for, for solar. Awesome. And there are, yeah, there are um, lots of cool things in the chat there. Um, I think we want to try to facilitate a little bit of, you know, we set this up as a webinar so we could do polling, but it means we don't get to see everyone's faces quite as easily. But I think we'll stop sharing and try to um, unmute folks if you have a question or want to share a comment that way. And certainly um, if if the um, mayor or county exec have anything. The last thing I'll say before I shut this, just so I remember to, is just thank you. I mean, this, this, this collaborative only works because all of you show up and share ideas and take what you learn and go back to your communities. You know, you make it so rewarding for us to do this work with you because you are um, really um, making things happen on the ground across across the county in ways that are just a delight to see. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. So I have a little bit. And if if somebody has something to share, um, panelists, you all have that ability. Um, I think other people might be able to, I don't know if you can even raise your hand. I guess you maybe need to put something in the chat and I will um, unmute you is maybe a way to do that. Folks may be able to raise their hands um, and get recognized. Okay. Well, while we're waiting to see if anybody wants to raise their hand, let me just add my thanks as well. And, you know, I think there's a lot for us to keep working on together. Obviously, we're going to keep going on the solar front and, and, you know, keep thinking about how we can make that available to our communities. Um, but, uh, you know, as I put in the chat, I'm very interested in continuing to partner with folks around transit um, and how we expand the service um, as far as possible out into the county and make sure that people have that as a transportation option. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunity still on stormwater. The city is, uh, Madison is uh, mapping our entire watershed. Um, and that overlaps with um, some of you, and I know we're working together on that, but I think there's a lot of things that we can do together on um, resilience and thinking about preparing for future flooding. Um, I think the tree canopy question is part of that. So I'm very excited. Anything that has to do with trees, yay. Um, but yeah, I think I just think there's so much for us to keep working on together, and um, I'm very eager to to um, focus our efforts in the places that that there's the most interest. So uh, please don't hesitate to to share that um, now, certainly, but 
Also, uh, as you go forward, um, don't hesitate to get in touch with Kathy or Stacy. But it looks like we have a couple people who jumped in that might want to speak. Yeah, I, I um, promoted um, Dave Benferrato and Jeffrey Leverage because you both had um, comments in the chat there that um, maybe you wanted to share something about. Sure, Dave, Dave Benferrato here, Village of Charwood Hills. We just love these get togethers. Um, we have a very small village staff and the comment I put in there were, were, you know, tips and tricks for small communities that don't have a lot of staff. So we appreciate all the work all of you have done, all of the leadership, all of the sharing of ideas and successful approaches and so on. Um, keep up the good work. Let's keep sharing and pushing the bar. Yeah, this is Jeff Leverage. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I uh, wonder if there's some kind of uh, compendium in the works or that already exists regarding private sector development, or, you know, expansion growth within or around cities relative to um, state laws and the restrictions that municipalities have on what they can do. I understand there's more flexibility within a TIF proposal uh, that a municipality can control, but there are other aspects out of their power that they don't control. Maybe many people here are more knowledgeable than I am, a little bit new to this, but that would be helpful for me. Noted. I am making a note about that. I do not have that answer, but but yes, I can agree that that it's probably an area for some more um, for some more information. Anything else from folks that you want to share? Otherwise, you know, I'm also really happy to give you 12 minutes of your life back so that you have maybe an actual break between meetings because because that doesn't happen in our virtual world all the time. Um, maybe again, just thank you all for um, being part of this. It really is like one of my favorite things about my job. And I have a lot of favorite things about my job, but this is like high on the list is, is this work with, with all of you communities. So um, we did record this. We'll, um, we'll um, load it to our YouTube stuff and send out a link in the next kind of communications to folks so that if, if there's a piece that you wanted to go back to, um, you can do that. And we will also make sure that we've got those links shared out to you again in terms of the spot in our Google folder where Stacy has compiled all these amazing links to um, federal funding resources. She's, she's created a, an amazing set of resources there. So I think that's gonna be really helpful. Anything else from anybody? Hearing nothing, I say we're adjourned. Thanks everybody. Great to, Thanks, to see you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.